There we go. <clears throat> okay. So, um, uh, so uh, this chapter is about using the resampling techniques we used last week. So, uh, last um, week. Can you uh, please, um, the view is somehow for me too small. Too small. Okay. Better? Okay. Uh, also, let's maybe pull this in. I might have to show that. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, basically last week we went over resampling, um, which is a really important technique for uh, allowing us to use our models, uh, sorry, use our data in order to do uh, multiple models so that we can pull out, pull out a better model because obviously when we do our data analysis, it might actually have a slightly biased approach because of how data is selected or what data we're using. Whereas when we actually sample data, we find that actually, typically speaking, we get a better model, which is uh, got more utility for generalization when it comes to future prediction, uh, which makes the model more useful in the future. Um, so just quickly to go over that, a few of the ways that you might do that is uh, uh, V-fold or K-fold cross-validation. Uh, you might use Monte Carlo methods or bootstrapping, and in time series, you would definitely use uh, rolling cross-validation. Um, and the, these basically just help us to evaluate our models a lot better. Um, so when we do cross-validation, we take our data, which is already in a training and a test set, and we split our training set into a um, into a uh, into another. Uh, what was, what was the phrase that you used below? I can't remember. Um, using a another training kind of set, I suppose, and a validation. So the test set remains separate from everything else overall, but we split our training set into two sections, which are for building our models and for validating our models, um, which is where we basically got to last week. So where we're at uh, right now is, uh, is we want to use these uh, resamples in order to build multiple new models. And the reason why I want to do that is because we I want to compare, make comparisons within models. So that's if we want to use different pre-processing or different um, features, or we might want to look at um, different models. Uh, so for instance, might want to compare a, uh, a neural net versus a random forest model. Um, regardless of what the target is, the approach is reasonably, much as, reasonably the same, which is we have to create our recipes, uh, and specify our models. And then we have to then we build multiple models uh, on the resampled data. And then we capture the accuracy metrics for that uh, from each resampled validation. And then we compare the accuracy of these models um, with, of each fold. And then we can measure the, a, uh, the significance of difference between those different models, um, which is, you know, you can use an ANOVA or alternatively, you can use a Bayesian approach for that. Um, you know, you can see the book for more details about that. Interesting enough, you can apply this with model time as well, which I just learned earlier, which is quite nice. Um, so uh, why do you want to use tidy models? Well, it's basically quick, pretty straightforward and quite fast when you're doing multiples. Um, and uh, just to go over quickly the code that we have at the moment, at this point, uh, we have split our data into training and testing sets. We have created a recipe, which is uh, the formula for our models. We've normalized it. Uh, we've also created an other factor to capture the bits which can uh, have a quite big effect on the size of our contrasts. So we've, anything that's like less than 1% of our data is into an other category uh, for the neighborhood uh, area. We've got our uh, we've dummy coded our nominals. We've specified interaction terms and we've created a spline, which I believe is something like 20 uh, degrees of freedom. Um, and then we've also created specifications for a linear model and a random forest, uh, and we've set up model workflows um, for uh, t uh, tenfold cross-validation, which is pretty standard, to be honest, uh, when, you try, when you're doing cross-validation. Uh, and we've also already fitted a random forest model using, uh, using workflows. I'm just gonna run these quickly. Um, what's this? Let's 
seems to be running. Right. And this is our data so far, where we're up to. Uh, let's get that done. Seems to work, but I want to do it through the console. It looks like one of the packages didn't load. Mm. Let's run those again, just to see which ones. Tidy are. models. Failed to attach tidy models. We're updating. It might have messed up one of the packages. Well, well hmm. just try it again, I guess. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. What's that? That's resample, isn't it? It's the library R samples, which is not loading. Uh, it's it's a part of tidy models, but I think you need to install it separately. So. Mm. Where you have it installed, I'm sure. Yeah, or if it got corrupted when you were updating. Yeah. Have you restarted since you updated? Uh, oh, no, I haven't. It's um, R sample, not resample, I think. R sample, yeah, that's correct. That's it. Yeah, just re try restarting it, maybe. Okay, it's restarting now. So let's hope that worked. It's going so slow. Maybe I will turn. Uh, I think if you up. like control shift F10. Oh, there it goes. Okay. I'm just going to turn off uh, shuttle mode of Windows just to increase speed. Right. No errors, yay. That's working, sweet. Excellent, right. So, oh, we can actually see that anyway. So we see where we are. Um, so at the end of the last one, we actually have this, uh, these uh, splits from the Ames folds. So you can see that it's split into uh, 2,100 uh, and 235, so that's your, uh, basically, your analysis and that's your assessment set um, for, um, for your cross-validations. Um, let me just run that again, there you go, you see, you see that. And there's 10 of those, uh, but they're all slightly different because if, uh, if we go back to looking at that uh, image at the top, it splits up something like this, so it just partitions it different each time for each of the 10 folds. And then, um, so what we were basically going to do in this one is we're going to apply several different models across each of the 10 folds. So here are the 10 we're going to use. What we're going to do is we're going to have a basic linear model, um, which has got new normal log transformations. It's got the other step and it's got the dummy as mentioned before. And then we're going to add an interactive term. So basically it's the same basic model 
apart from we're adding an, an interaction into our, uh, our, our regression. If anyone doesn't know what uh, we're talking about, just let us know. And then we're adding splines in. So that's basically allows the line or, you know, the, uh, the trend model or to be able to add curvatures in it so that it can move along with the data in order to better fit the data. You have to be really careful with those because you can definitely overfit with splines. And then um, we've got this pre-processing. So what we do is once we've got these three recipes, we're going to put them into a list. So it's just called a list. And then you have just given different, and then we give them different names just to make it easier to understand. So instead of calling it basic recipe, we just call it basic and then we've got interacting with splines. So that's just the name of the list. That's just the object here. It's just this list with these three names for those three recipes in it. And then we're going to apply that to a workflow set, which is basically a way of mapping across different work, workflows. It's all at once rather than just doing one workflow at a time. So this is actually the really cool bit. So um, it's, just, it's going to save a lot of time if you do lots of multiple models. So if we just like put this out, you can see that what we've got now is a tibble. Um, and in that tibble, we have this these options, which are uh, which are, I believe that these things are empty at the moment, but when we do the resampling, what happens is these workflow IDs are then used in order to, uh, um, to analyze the data with the resampling. And then that will give us this data in here. So um, basically the way how it does that is uh, we resample the models, we use the workflow map, which, um, basically is like per and it just iterates through the model process and all we do is we give it an argument of the functions to be applied so here's our linear model we're just going to call this linear models and what we do is we take uh, the linear models um, uh, tibble which is up here and then we we apply it to the workflow map and we say we just want to fit the samples so that's the function we're giving to it and then uh, in this case there's been a seed set so that it's reproducible and verbose so that we can read the arguments and then we're giving it in the resamples. So that's the different folds that we've set up earlier on. So that's the number of folds. And then uh, we've told it to keep the predictions. So this is how we can look at the data later. So we keep the predictive uh, information. So if we just run that, then we'll come up with, uh, once you, well, while waiting for it. Well, after running this code, we can see that the, um, that the options are filled in. And uh, this includes the uh, fit resamples, which allows us, which is good for reproducibility. And in addition to that, the results columns are populated as well. So we can see down here, we've got resampling happening and it's telling you how long it's taking each time. This part's actually quite important because if your models are taking a really long time, you need to know whether it's worthwhile to run the model because sometimes the amount of time it takes to process can outweigh the value of adding in a slight improvement in the model, which is what we'll see further down. Um, so one of the other things is we can now, so now that we've done this, we can basically pull out the RMSE or the, um, uh, or the R squared value. So those are just values of, um, of fit or um, accuracy. Um, so in this particular case here, um, it's already got it saved in uh, the cache. But um, basically you can see that we've been pre-processed with recipe, and then we've got linear regression, and then we've pulled out, because we've selected here, we've pulled out the metric for the RMSE. But if you look, if you wanna just look at it quickly, um, you can see that when we look at the, when we, do, when we go back to, so this is the workflow originally, and then when we, when we apply this function on it, collect metrics, it tells you the accuracy because this data is now filled up in our model. Um, it's because of the, because it's been resampled. So we can now pull out this data and what this has done is given us these different metrics, which are, which happen when we do our linear model. And they allow us to say, well, this is the mean RMSE for the 10 folds for this particular model. And this is the mean for the, for the 10 RMSE for this particular model, which is all very, very good. Um, now it's easier when you visualize it. So we'll just have a quick look at this auto plot. So this was in the book, 
Um, now in the book, it only shows one side because he, he specifies this section here where it says metric equals R RSQ. So that's if you just want to look at the RSQ. If you want to look at the RMSC, you can see that they basically follow similar trajectory, but it's just one goes up and the other one goes down. So in the case of the RMSE, a lower score is better than a higher score. And um, also, what's one to four? It's a good question. Um, well, you can see the order in which they're here. So the RMS, so when you're looking at this, it's just the order in which they come in on this in this particular tibble. So this is the random forest, obviously, because it says over here. And then you've got three linear models, which gradually improve. So this is our basic model. This is our model with uh, interaction term. And this is the model with the interaction term and the splines. You can see there's a slight improvement in each one, whereas the uh, RMSE and the uh, uh, R squared values are saying to us that the random forest is much better. But say we wanted to continue with the uh, linear model, linear regression, we still would want to find out whether there was significant difference amongst these. So one more thing to say about this graph is what it's showing us here is the variation in the accuracy scores for each of those models across the 10 resamplings that we did. If we did 30 resamples, it would probably narrow those bands a little bit um, because it's an error term. Um, now, where are we here? What's this part here? So if you want to just collect out the data, you can, so with this bit of data, which is also in, um, in the book, if you select out the, you can select out the columns and this shows you all the data. So it shows you all the accuracy, which is used to populate these bars. So they're basically, they're just error bars. And this is the data for each column, which is each for each model. So, um, sorry, the, sorry, August. The, yeah. um, did the models get, the linear models, they didn't get worse with more, with things added to them, did they? No, they or got better. Just misread? No, no, no they, they the, got better. He, it does write it wrong in the book. So as in two, three, four, looks like it's getting uh, worse, right? In, oh, on that yeah, you're right. Sorry, that's a, so I must have mentioned it the wrong way around, unless I am wrong. Well, I mean, also, they're, they're totally within the error, right? As in, it all seems random, but... Yeah, that's a good point. Four models. And the forest. But, uh, what is is the it... I think that needs to correct it. I think that, that something needs to change there to make it more obvious as to which model is which. Yeah, I think um, you're right. Um, is it even possible to... Surely you can't add terms and get a lower R squared, can you? Um, um, I mean... Because it would... Well, yeah, I don't know. I guess surely, yeah, no. You must be able well, to in some well, cases. It depends if, if it's adjusted, because if it's adjusted, it, you could get a worse R squared if you add more terms, because it's penalised slightly. Yeah, that would. It's not adjusted, though. They don't... They don't, it's, it was somewhere, I read it in there, it said it does not do adjusted R squared when it provides this and statistic. This, that's weird that's, that it gets worse. That's really good to know, actually, because I didn't know that. Um, uh, it, it, it is weird that it gets worse. And if that's in the right order, I, for some reason earlier, I thought it was the other way around. But that might just be because my brain was thinking, oh, uh, I didn't that's what that makes sense. sense. Yeah, yeah. But he does mention in the book, it gets worse when you add more terms in. And I thought that can't be right. So yeah, I think I'm thinking exactly the same, Luke. Um, yeah, so it seems to get worse. Bizarrely. Um, let's see. We can actually look at these terms right here. So hang on a second. If we um, if I take this bit of code here, and then just do so, if I go back and just do that bit. Yeah. Ah, oh, bugger. Wait, no, because looking at the actual values there, basic is 0.07 RMSE. Oh, wait, 0 0.079, 0 0.078, 0 0.077. Yeah, it's just marginally, just barely getting, performing slightly worse with each one. 
Yeah. So the RMSE is getting worse, but the uh, no, it, wait, so it's, hang on a second. The RMSE is getting lower. So if the RMSE is getting lower, what? then it must mean that they're the, 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 they're the other way around because yeah, the RMSE. Sorry. sorry to interrupt, but are they not essentially the same because the era, because the they are in the overlap of the error bars? So our, you know, our interpretation of whether they are getting better or worse is irrelevant because the difference in them is just because of, you know, chance. Yeah, well, I agree with that. But um, what, 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 what I think, we're, sorry, we're trying to work out here is which number here relates to which which model. So as you, if you can see here, the RMSE for the basic linear model is. Uh, 0.791 and for this one for the interaction one is 0 0.784 and then the one down here is 0 0.771 and you see here that the number gradually gets lower as we go up so in terms of number so the question is is how do these numbers here associate or how do these models associate with this because if you were to get rid of this random forest, you'd just be having three linear models and you wouldn't know which one was which. Better access labels are needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it, is, it is a fair point about, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's within error. They are happening on, this is just a thought, they are being done on the same splits, right? It's the same 10 splits yeah, for each so model. Yeah. So we're about to come to that. Sorry. So I've taken I've taken way too long. So sorry, it's my um, fault for slowing us down. No, 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 not all. Uh, it's good to ask questions, and you know they're they're all important insights. Um, you know, uh, Anita is correct in the fact that there's not really much difference between them, and it's very important to know whether your access, what your x access is telling you because you might then select the wrong model. Um, so uh, anyway, so when we look at, we can look at the data directly and this shows us what our um, RMSE score is. But like if you to put R RSQ, you'd get the RSQ value here. And this is just how you get the data frame itself, which is very useful because that's what we want to do an Anover on. So um, what is it, one of the problems with this is because we are modeling on the on a tenfold cross validation, each fold is the same, and each model is doing a analysis to try to pick out um, the accuracy um, each time. So, what we can, because we've got these accuracy scores up here, um, what we can do is turn these accuracy scores into our y value, and turn our models into a uh, into a basically what is a diff four different levels or the levels of our mo of a regression model. Um, so the way how we do that is um, we've got this bit of code here, which allows us to basically capture the data that we want, which um, if we look at this, which is always quite nice to do, then we can see this is the data. It's just telling us what data is what and which estimates we've pulled out. And then we can do this bit as well. And that is, uh, so we can, so you can see that we've got an ID. So that's each fold of our cross validation. And this is each one of our, uh, each one of our measures. And you can see they're quite similar in many respects. And so when we do a correlation on this, we can see that they, there's very strong similarities between them. If we go back up here and just look at the numbers for a second, rather than looking at the uh, metric, we see that there is like a 94, um, a 0.94 Pearson's correlation between random between the random forest and the splines. And you can see these really high correlations throughout for all the models. And the reason for that is if we go back up to the top, look at, look at this, the structure of each um, each sample is the same for each model. So each model is going to do the same thing, which essentially means that because they're doing the same job on the same information, there's going to be a lot of crossover and similarity, which is a problem because for a, when we want to do a model comparison, say which model is better, we assume independence and we're not getting that here. Um, 
However, we proceed on. Um, so basically the high correlations of cross models indicate that there is a large within sample correlation, uh, which suggests a sample to sample effect. And you can see that when you go to this because there is a lot of, ooh, if you can see it, there is a lot of um, similarity in how it's processed. So you, you can see it's mostly flat across here and then it goes to random forest and it all goes up. So that is, because of these parallel lines, um, that's just a way of visualizing the fact that there's strong correlations across each one. So, um, so the cor and then you can also look at individual ones here and you see again, you know, it's 94%, it's massive, you know, that's a huge correlation. So this is a problem. Um, so the, Max and uh, Julia say, if there is significant positive covariance, then any statistical difference uh, would be critically underpowered because it's comparing uh, differences between two models, which are um, which are measuring very similar data. Uh, meaning the resample to resample effect would bias uh, any inferential model model such as an ANOVA um, to supporting the null hypothesis. So. Um, before going on, it's useful to define something like a practical effect size, like saying 2% in order to say, make sure we, we want our model to be big enough. So we can do a simple ANOVA on this. Um, and in the case, an ANOVA does serve quite well because to be honest, it's, it's often looking for similarity, looking for very differences between similar populations. And um, the way how it does this is we build a basic model. At the, we've got a basic model at the bottom. That's what this B means, zero. And then we, when we add our little term, add our terms here, they count for, well, the, what is our basic model plus what happens when we add an interaction or what's our basic model when we add, uh, when we compare the difference in the change of means to random forest? What is the beta coefficient change when we add an interaction terms and spline? So that's, that's how it's coded. It's just a simple ANOVA. It's not something that we really need to worry about too much. So what we do is we take our data frame, which looks like this, as you see. So our different things, and then we turn it into a wider, then what we do is we uh, calculate our differences. So we get a difference metric. So that's the difference between, for instance, the spline and the basic. And then we will do something like this. This is just a way of visualizing it. And then we can see the significant, how the significant difference is. We actually have a significant difference, which is actually quite interesting. But um, although we have a significant difference, the effect isn't actually very large. It's less than 1%. So if we were saying we want an effect of at least 1% in order to make this worthwhile to make a change to our model, then we would say that this is failing even if the p-value is significant. Um, and you could do a t-test as well. The better way to do it is to do a Bayesian comparison. And so if we do a Bayesian comparison, it takes all the same assumptions as a Gaussian uh, distribution, uh, zero mean, constant uh, standard deviation, and uh, it makes some additional assumptions as well uh, about the prior distribution, which we can capture out the model. Um, there's an awful lot of information on this, but basically if we use tidy posterior and our STAN arm, um, basic, what that allows us to do is to do a, um, a posterior ANOVA as it were, sorry, a Bayesian ANOVA as it were. And what we do is we throw in our four models. So if you remember our four models looks like looks like this. So that's our, uh, that's our models. And that is the, uh, basically how, the, how each model works. And this is a result from the sampling. Um, the reason why it says this is because these aren't, uh, whilst this is just one item, these are uh, tibbles inside a tibble. No, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, tibbles inside a tibble, which seems quite complicated. Um, anyway, so when we run this, Basically, it runs, uh, it uses tidy posterior. Oh my God, it's flying on right at the top. And then it basically, because it's rebuilding our data, uh, data using the data that from the resampling and building up its own distribution data, 
It takes quite a while to run, by the way. It basically, it basically like, uses that distribution to capture the data. Sorry. It's like it's like using kind of like Markov change is creating, it's mirroring the distribution with randomization and retesting it on those. Yeah, essentially what it does is, um, essentially what the Bayesian approach does, as I understand it, is rebuilds the data um, and in order to capture the parameters, which suggests, uh, which could allow you to, so you've got your priors and then with the priors, you can use that to predict your posterior. So prior is before test, before uh, analyzing and then posterior is what you have after you've done your testing. Um, I'm not, the problem is I'm not, I've only just started learning uh, Bayesian uh, statistics. So I'm not really the best person to ask about it as much as I'd like to, I'm much more a fr uh, frequentist um, and even worse later on is I do a lot more stuff in, uh, um, What's it in um, neural nets, which is probably Bayesian to be honest, but without actually necessarily knowing all the day what I should do, which is why I'm doing the other book club called, now called Regression and Other Stories. So if you want to join us on that, you're more than welcome. We're just starting this week. Um, the book is thirty five pounds. I don't know what is in dollars, uh, but you can buy it on Amazon. It's very popular. Anyway, <coughs> you don't Wait, necessarily what's the, need. What's the name of the book club? Uh, regression and other stories. It's by Gelman Hill and oh, okay, Gelman and Atari. yeah, he's a big time Bayesian. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, pretty good to learn some Bayes, I think. Um, I un I know the basics of it. Um, okay. but I do understanding it properly is uh, is another thing altogether. It is quite a big area. Um, it's a whole different way of thinking about statistics. Um, but in I suppose Bayesian statistics can be boiled down to the boiled down to what do, being more data driven, I would say, in order to pick out differences rather than uh, being. It requires a lot more calculation to do Bayesian than it does to do um, do uh, frequentist, and it assumes that data will constantly be updated, whereas frequentist kind of is like you do testing and then you work out your parameters and it assumes they're more stable. So it's a question of what is more stable uh, or if you're throwing more data in it, is um, is there going to be changes? Bayesian uh, models get better with more data. Um, anyway, so Within our system, we can basically use tidy posterior and our stan instead of doing an ANOVA. You can just use an ANOVA, it's perfectly fine, it's perfectly valid. So once you've got your metrics, you do an ANOVA, or you can do this method instead. Um, and the reason why you want to do this is after you've done all of this data and it's done all of these iterations, you can pull out, um, you can pull out your different bits of your data and look at it more easily. Is it going all the way up there? Right, and <clears throat> so basically what this did here was it took out the, it took out the data from our ANOVA that we did, from our Bayesian ANOVA, which was that RS, RSQ, and we put, pulled out the, um, the, R, the R squared value from our ANOVA. And you, you could look at the different elements, but it's the same thing again. Um, and then it allows us to, once we've got that, to look at the different models and see how the different samples overlap in terms of the posterior for the R squared. Because if you remember the R squared value is our dependent variable. So what we're doing by doing Bayesian is we're kind of like doing a lot more, we're kind of repeating this again and again and again in order to build up population, this resampling. And what we can see is the amount of overlap between the different elements. You can see it's not too different from further up when we had the error bars in the same, that, in the same way that, for instance, the, uh, so in terms of R squared, the spline, also because it's labeled, it's easier to understand. The random forest is best again. Basic is doing the worst. The interaction is doing slightly better and the spline is doing slightly better. But you can see the overlap is that the, um, 
splines, the interaction, and the basic linear model are doing, roughly speaking, the same. Um, so we would probably select the random forest model. Uh, oh, God, why does it keep doing that? Anyway. Right. Anyway, so we could do an auto plot on this again, which is a great little function. So we take our Bayesian model, put an auto plot on it. And we can see, we can just see this in a different way. I think it looks better like this personally. Um, and then what you can do is you can do your Bayesian comparisons. And this is really, really, really good because once you've done this bit here, stop it. Thanks, our studio. Oh, I know, so, so annoying. Once you've done, <laughs> anyway, right, so what this bit here is, is if you remember further up, we were looking at, we were comparing one model to the other as opposed to comparing all three. So what we could do is select our individual models from our contrast out with the, Bay with the Bayesian approach. So we've got this, uh, we've got this function called uh, contrast models. We put in our ANOVA, our Bayesian ANOVA, and then we select from the list item one and item two. And then from that, we can then build this um, using, we can build this graph and you can see how much they overlap. And it's easier with this. So then you can see the probability of gaining this effect again, which is the splines versus the basic LM. Um, and you can see that actually there's a statistically significant difference there. Uh, and the probability of getting it again is 100%, basically, or that's what it suggests. Um, I'm always skeptical when it tells you it's 100%, um, but, you know, whatever. Um, so there's another thing that you can do, and this is the really cool bit. So you can take uh, the region of practical equivalence from the Bayesian ANOVA, um, and you can get your, uh, with the, these RSQ values here, what's that? So see what that looks like, see all your differences. If you pick a size of 2%, that means you're picking an effect size of 2%, as is mentioned in the book, um, then you can do a contrast comparison instead. And then what this says here is, is there a significant negative effect or significant positive difference, or is it practically equivalent? And what it's saying is, despite the fact that there is a significant chance of seeing a slight improvement for the splines model every single time you do it, the, the practical equivalence between the two models is when you're choosing a set effect size of 2% is um, exactly the same. There is not enough difference between the two to say that they are anything more than equivalent. And that's why it's such a cool thing to do. Um, and you can see that here when you pull out this plot, which shows, oh, look, um, random forest, there is a practical probable equivalence, the probable equivalence is, uh, or practical equivalent means that the random forest is always going to be the linear model. Uh, by comparison, the three other models are not significantly different from each other, uh, although that's not the right time to use in Bayes. I apologize to Bayesians everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that, that's basically it for this chapter. Now, I'm just going to quickly go through a time series example because you can do this with time series. And I have basically taken this from Cran uh, and it's uh, um, uh, Matt Danko's example. And, um, you know, his stuff's pretty awesome. Um, well worth looking up because he's the main guy for time series along with Rob Heinemann. Uh, um, so basically, if we just have a quick look, here's our data. So we've got this time series data here, and we've got this basic uh, trend going through it. And you've got your seasonal components, cyclic uh, components here. I mean, and there's even another cyclic component in there if uh, we break it down even further, but like, anyway, never mind. Um, so what you could do is you could do your resampling here, and this is resampling process. So you need to have model time and time key uh, TK to do this. And in this, you select your data, and then say what your assessment period is. So that's the amount of time you take to assess. Um, the initial uh, time point, so that's five years. So um, that's the training window. So you have an assessment window, a training window, and then you've got a skip. Uh, so that's like how many years gap, but you could do this in months or weeks, doesn't or days, doesn't have to be in years. And then uh, you've got a slice limit, which is um, how many resamples you're gonna generate. In this case, it's four. 
um, which isn't very good if you want to do an over, but um, I mean, I could turn it into 10, but it will take a lot longer. So I'm going to avoid doing that for now. So this is basically how you create your resamples. It is built on tidy models, uh, but it's just built for time, just adapted for time series. If you think of tidy models as a kind of like, a, what's it, a wrapper for, mod, um, for tidy, tidy models. No, model time is a wrapper for tidy models, um, but for time series analysis, if anyone else is using that. Um, so if we want to visualize it quickly, we can visualize our uh, splits. So you can see that what we've done is break this time series that's further up. There you go. And we've broken it down into these different components. Now, if you remember, we did the rolling time series before. The rolling time series uh, for cross-validation is just take out different sections and then move back in time, move forward in time. Right? But uh, model time works the other way around, which it moves back in time and gradually predicts forward and then it predicts, uses the errors from that, which is really pretty cool. Um, I think it works better actually. Anyway, so you can see that it's predicting, the slice one is predicting the very end of the time series with this period in between. Uh, slice two is predicting like slightly later period and ch choosing, again, the same kind of time cuts just with a slightly different period in between. Okay, and then, um, then you create your workflows. Um, again, it's just you create some recipes, you put them into a list, and that's all this is. The same thing as above, apart from it's using uh, the model time, it's using time TK and the model time system for the same stuff. The information is easy to get, but basically these are just recipes. Um, and then what you do is you do your resampling, you fit your resampling um, using uh, model, uh, model time fit resamples which is the same thing that we were doing above. It's just a slightly different name for the same system. And it's taking forever. That's forever in your world. I walk <laughs> away, I come back two hours later and it's still running. <laughs> uh, the life of data scientists is fun. I've logged so many hours on uh, Clash of Clans. My boss didn't even realize. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> well, I say that. Um, <clears throat> I spend a lot of my time trying to optimize stuff to speed it up. Anyway, right, so now that we've done that bit, um, what we've got here is we've got a model timetable and it's then just populated data. So as before, when we um, did our fitting of our models, um, all it's done is just populate the information to the side. In this case, instead of calling it um, option and uh, result, they uh, it's just got it all in this S3 object instead to the side. But you don't need to know that. What you can see is this instead. Oh, fuck. That's so annoying. Um, you can just use your outline on the right. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't done it in the time series section. Actually, I might just quickly create a, um, let's see, quickly. Do you think it's because a, of the interactive editor that this problem is there? I don't know. Uh, if I just put, oh, it's got, for some reason it's going incredibly slowly. It never goes this slow. Uh, Zoom really uh, can slow things down. Uh, no shortcut. Right. Why is it not created? Uh, hmm. is, it, is it Zoom? Um, uh, what if I do this? Uh, Oh, never mind. Uh, we're almost at the end. Um, if we do this here, we can see what the model time data looks like. So if you remember before we got our predictions out, there's quite a big difference between the, um, between the model time, between what happens in model time and what happens in tidy models. So instead of getting our RMSC value straight away and selecting those, we actually get our predictive values for each splice. 
for each slice um, and the rows. So we'd have to, so you, you'd be like, oh, well, I've got to calculate those separately, each one. Um, shortcut didn't work. Anyhow, um, what happened there? Oh, sorry, I created those models. Um, so when you look at it, you can see the accuracy differences between the different models. So in this case, it gives a clearer label. So we've got a Rima at the bottom, which is this blue color, and then we've got the profit. And you can look across the different measures of RMSE, MAPI, or whatever. I tend to go with, personally, RMSE, and just look for a lower value of that. Um, it tends to be my preference. Um, depends really on the model, but typically speaking, what you want is the best across all six kind of measures really well five i don't really use uh um r squared so much time series because it's not really necessarily the best thing to use um anyway we can compare the overall results uh by using this function here um and that just pulls out the value for each model um, if you got rid of this, then it would just do it in the console. If you got rid of this function here, it would just do it in the console instead. So just see. Now, the, when we look at this, we'll be like, oh, this is the aggregate. So how can we do an anover on this? If you change this part to null, then it pulls out the uh, then it pulls out the R the, the different error values for each one. And the slices. So the slice is what we would call the fold, but because it's a rolling forecast, it's a slice. And then we've got one for each of our um, for each. We've got four slices for each of our models, and we've got again our RSQ value or our MAPI value if we so want it. And did I create a? Did I finish doing this bit? Let's see if I did. Yeah, so that's so you need to convert it into the same kind of model as you would do with um, in the tidy models framework. It does this bit automatically, whereas in the model time framework, you've got all these other metrics instead. But it doesn't automatically convert it into um, into a column for each model with uh, your IDs for each fold down the side. Because the folds, if you remember, if go back up to this image up here. They're the same, and just in the same way that the they're the same for the Ames data set, but this is in time series. So you see each slice, this is slice one with our uh, validation set here, slice two with our training validation set, slice three, slice four, and that's what these represent. And we've got our names up here, and this tells us how accurate it is with the, what did I use here? R, the, <laughs> I actually did use R squared value. Um, so put the R squared value in here. Um, so if you go down to the bottom, then this very last bit is actually a um, it's a correlation test. But you can easily do the same thing with a ANOVA as well. And the reason why it works is because it doesn't matter that it's in time series. What matters is that you have your accuracy measures and you're comparing across the, those across the different slices. And that's your data in that particular case. So... If you, so you can apply that in a Bayesian approach or in a frequentist approach, entirely up to you. Um, unfortunately, I haven't quite finished this, so I can't show you uh, the Bayesian version of doing it the time, or with the time series data, but it is exactly the same. And the beauty of the, um, the beauty of the tidy models approach up here, is the fact that it, if you do create a database just like this, you can throw it into this system here, uh, as it states, I believe, um, on the per mod function. Yeah, these could also have been generated non-standard means, which is what I did. Technically non-standard means means it's not generated through tidy models, but you'll wanna make sure that the data that goes into it is very similar. Okay, uh, that's it. Cool, thank you.
Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Louis. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have someone for next week. Yes, that is true. Is there anybody who is interested in doing the chapter on what is it? Uh, is next week? Is model tuning and dangers of overfitting? My, yeah, model tuning, dangers of overfitting. Um, is anybody interested in doing that one? Temptation to nominate Kevin because he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> he has already gone twice, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking either like. Janita, you, you haven't gone yet. Would you like to do it? Are you still here? Or did you dip out? Is Janita still here? Yeah, Janita's still here. Janita, do you want to do the presentation next um, week? Um, I haven't gone yet. I think I might be a little bit out of my depth, but I will have a go. Okay, you want to try it? Yes. That's okay. awesome. Thanks. Um, thank Thanks you, uh, if you if you go on to the uh, R4DS um, onto the notes book for this chapter, sorry for this book, you you might see that they've already done the chapter. So rather than having to actually build a presentation, you could just um, just present what's already been done. So you just read the chapter and then try and follow. Um, you know, watch the presentation, and that might actually make it a lot easier to uh, to understand. Um, don't worry about being out of your depth. I'm constantly out of my depth. Yeah. Yeah, and you can just, you can add stuff like from your domain or something that you think would be interesting. Like, you can be creative too, whatever you want to do. We'll be happy with whatever. Thanks for volunteering. Does anyone have any questions about, um, about the modeling process, why you might do it? uh resampling and uh, anything anything about this today really uh i um so i was i'm uh, confused about that uh, uh anova as a way of comparing models um, as far as i understood that the problem is that uh, we are uh, uh, like measuring the two models performance on the same set of data and since it's uh, correlated, they're not really independent. Yeah, I, I, see, I see what you're talking about there. Um, I, I was kind of confused because they seem to be saying that um, because the data is very similar, because data is similar um, and it's creating yeah. similar populations, that it kind of violates sphericity rules. And yet then they went on to say, well, you could just use simple ANOVA. And I wasn't quite sure where it was going with that. Um, if anyone else read that chapter and interpreted it in a different way, I'm really open uh, to un understanding why that was different. Because it makes sense that it breaks the rules of uh, independence. Right. And yet at the same time, the different level, at the same time, you'd expect there to be some similar similarity between, um, between levels of uh, ANOVA anyway. So um, yeah. I think it seems to be fine. And um, yeah, I I I I can't say I don't didn't understand why they brought it up and then said, oh well, you can just use an and it's fine. I or that's the way how I interpreted it. So maybe I'm just being a moron. Uh, I'm more than happy to be wrong here. So correlated data. Um, do you think that uh, uh, you know like a pair t test kind of thing would be better uh, rather than you know like simple uh, t test that they are trying to do here um well uh, i i think the bayesian approach works better than this yeah bayesian definitely works better but like i'm saying that instead of uh, you know they they have tried a simple anova and uh, said that uh, you know simple anova or t test uh, is not the right way because the the values are correlated and all uh, so like again like i'm just uh, 
thinking out loud like i, I haven't really tried anything yet but yeah i, I mean what the if we go back to um if we go to the chapter can you um can you can, can you see my screen yeah is it is it the book yeah okay um they basically say um basically what they're saying is the covariance between yeah. the two variables is really bad um but yeah. they're not um i suppose what they're but the, what they're also saying though is is if they're in i suppose what they're saying is if they're in columns it's bad because if you have them in the they're acting like separate beaters but when you act when you split them up in terms of as a factor level instead it's okay because factor levels can deal with that but the but the but if there is different columns they don't um oh god <laughs> um okay. oh because well, it's kind of like there's i suppose because there's correlations between predictors but with le- with factor levels you probably expect there to be some correlations between factor levels and the ANOVA can deal with that, but it can't deal with the correlations between the predictors instead. Mm. Um, or that's how I interpret it. Um, because that's why they go on about this part here, isn't it? Right. I have to get going, guys. Thank you, August. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. Yeah, chisel. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. Thanks, okay, thanks, guys. Yep.